Today, we are going to cover everything you could possibly want to know about Beckett Simonon shoes. Everything from the materials out of which they are made to the intricacies of their design. What flaws do they have? How do they compare to American legacy shoe company, Allen Edmonds? And lastly, though most importantly, are they worth your money? These are my Cohen loafers by Beckett Simonon. They are well-worn, well-loved, and have kept me looking sharp with many a client for the several years I've had them. But we are not going to be talking about these shoes today. Instead, we're going to be talking about these. These are the Dean Oxfords in Oak. They are medium brown cap toe Oxfords in full grain calfskin and come in a nicely designed green shoe box with silky shoe bags that have a soft velvety leather friendly interior. They also come with these optional foam insoles for those who want a little extra padding. While Beckett Simonon has a variety of options, when I reached out to them to review their products, I chose this simple, classic, timeless design because it really allows us to assess the fundamentals of craftsmanship, the stitching quality, leather quality, minute details, and overall last design. And it functions as a perfect comparison to the similarly designed Allen Edmonds flagship shoe, the Park Avenue. And before we jump in, I have to tell you, I did get these shoes for free, and if you order any Beckett Simnon products through my affiliate link, Dresswell gets a small commission at no extra cost to you. If you choose to do so, thank you. It supports the work I do here to create these free, comprehensive resources for everyone. Does it mean I'm selling out? Does it mean this review is doctored and dishonest? Does it mean that I'm here to sell you Beckett Simonon and nothing else? These are all excellent questions, the answers to which I cannot give you. You must conclude them on your own. Though for those particularly concerned, I do speak more on transparency and review integrity at the end of the video. And as always, there is no agreement about what I can or cannot say about the company or its products either in or outside of this video. Starting off with construction and materials, let's take a look inside the shoe. Now, all Beckett Simonon products are Blake stitch construction, and that includes the Dean Oxfords here. Now, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of construction, but fundamentally, what this means is that the two primary components of the shoe, the uppers, the sort of top half, and the outsole, the bottom half, are connected through just one primary stitch. That's this stitch right here. You can see running through the entire shoe up through the insole. This means a variety of things, and we'll talk more about the difference between Goodyear Welt and Blake Stitch later, though fundamentally the most important thing is that water will wick up through this thread. These shoes are not for rainy days. Moving on, we have the laces. These are very standard dark brown waxed cotton round laces. They have a nice weave tightness to them. And you'll notice the shoe itself here comes with these metal eyelets that will just help the durability and longevity of the shoe. And then the upper leather. Now this leather comes from Grupo Mostrato. It's a large tannery group based in Italy. They have 15 facilities, 11 in Italy, one in Tunisia, Mexico, Indonesia, and Brazil. They're a pretty big organization. They don't quite have the reputation of quality as uh, something like Weinheimer or Anna When assessing the quality of leather, I think about it in two distinct categories. The first is cleanliness. How does the shoe visually look? Does it have any defects? Warping, wrinkles, micro creases, scratches, dye errors, discoloration. And I think of this in three different grades, low, mid, and high. Low grade is the leather has defects and they will be noticed by other people. Mid grade is it has defects, but the only person who's gonna notice them is you. High grade is anywhere from marginal defects to completely flawless. These shoes have mid-grade leather. They do have defects. We'll talk about them later in the imperfection section. And then the second category is softness. Now Beckett Simonon does market heavily that their shoes have no break-in period due to using very soft leather. And that is, in my experience, true. My Cohen loafers are about as comfortable now as they were the day I opened them up. And that is very comfortable. I wear them every day. Typically with higher end shoes, you actually don't want a soft leather. And that's because the primary reason you spend four, five, six hundred dollars on a shoe is for a sculpturally complex last. And therefore you want a stiffer leather that will hold its exact shape over time. This shoe has a fairly basic last. We'll talk more about it later. I don't think you're losing a whole lot by having a softer leather here. Now going over the rest of the materials, we're gonna start at the bottom here. 
with the top lift. This is SBR rubber, that is a synthetic rubber. It's got a nice cross grain pattern, which will just help a little more with traction, and it's very well milled. All the edges are very sharp, very crisp. Then moving up, we have the heel stack layers. These are full vegetable tan layers. Now that is pretty surprising, actually, at this price. I would fully expect leather board or even a synthetic material. So to have full leather layers here is pretty impressive. And to give you an idea of why they can actually do that at this price, let me show you. See this little notch right here, you'll notice? That is because, from my understanding, in order to save on costs and create this full leather heel block, Beckett Simonon will sometimes use two scraps of leather that qualify for this need, but are not big enough on their own. So they'll mill them and then fit them together and then glue them together at the sides and then use them as one layer. Is that ideal? No, but I would much rather have a split layer of full leather than a full layer of leather board. Then moving up a layer, we have the outsole. This is a full vegetable tan outsole here. It has an open channel and you can see the open channel is milled very well. It's very deep and that threading, the sole stitch that holds the whole shoe together is placed well within it, which will provide it that extra protection. Then moving up again, you have a midsole here, which is a leather midsole. Again, it's not a huge deal, but it's nice to see. This could totally be synthetic. It's not something anyone's typically going to see. Then moving up again to the outside, we have this 360 degree welt. Now this is a fake welt. This is primarily decorative. You can see here, this stitching does not go anywhere, though it does functionally serve to protect the seam between the outsole and upper from penetration of any environmental water, oils, or salts that would cause deterioration from the inside. It is nice to have. It's also nice that it's real leather and not like a rubber fake welt. And then moving up again a layer, you have a thicker fiberboard layer to provide a little more structure, a little more height to the shoe, as well as act as a basin for our next layer, which is the steel shank. Now the shank in the shoe provides a little more support so that this arch here doesn't collapse over time. Typically at this price, I would really expect to see something synthetic or maybe a cheap thin wood or even no shank at all you can see. Moving up again, you have this white layer here. This is the insole. This is Salpa. Salpa is a type of leatherboard created using natural latex as its binder. It's not the best. Ideally, you'd have a real leather insole that will provide a little more padding as well as be a higher quality material. Though at this price, you would typically expect a lower grade compressed cardboard or even fully synthetic insole. Then moving up again, you have a sort of EVA foam pour on material just to provide a little more cushion, a little more comfort in the heel. And then lastly, on top of all of that, we have this leather sock liner here. This will provide just a tiny bit more padding and protection, but more importantly, it'll help provide a barrier so that when water, if it does ever wick up through that sole stitch, it won't immediately contact your foot. It'll have to go through that insole, which hopefully you're not walking in that sort of water anyways. Now we are going to move up to the upper lining. Now this is Vaquetta leather. What really is Vaquetta leather and how should you be valuing it as a consumer? Well, there's no formal definition. Vaquetta leather is widely considered to be untreated dual tan leather that comes in two broader grades of quality. It is leather that has not been rolled in a drum to provide any kind of finish, which is why it has that natural golden hue. And it is tanned twice. First, it is vegetable tan to provide that hue, and then it is tanned a second time to create that ultra supple velvety quality it is so well known for. And for higher grade Vaquetta, that second tannage is done using natural fats and oils, which is an expensive labor intensive process. Lower grade Vaquetta instead uses chrome tanning, which is much less expensive, though achieves very similar results. This uses lower grade Vaquetta. It is not the elite billionaire handbag leather that the term Vaquetta typically refers to. And you wouldn't expect that at this price anyway. Marketing aside, it's nothing special but it is a solid material that serves its purpose. It is soft, supple, and makes for a comfortable shoe. But let's move on to something that is not just marketing material, but is in fact objectively incredible, which is this suede heel counter here. So this is a piece of Vaquetta leather turned inside out, so the suede portion is on the back 
it helps provide a little more grip for your heel when it's in the shoe. But more importantly, it's just a really nice sign of craftsmanship. There are shoes that are in the $400, $500 range that don't have this, and you don't start to see it until you get up into those prices. And again, is kind of an example of how much more you get in the shoe in terms of detail when you give up the cost of having Goodyear Weld. And then moving right behind that, we have the structural heel counter. This just provides a little more structure to the heel, a little more shape. This is Celastic. Now, Celastic is kind of the bottom rung of high quality stitched leather footwear, internal structural materials. You have Celastic, leather board, and then real leather. Celastic is essentially a fiber plastic blend. And then moving up, we have the French binding. This is a small piece of leather that goes between the upper and the lining. It provides a little more structure to the top line of the shoe as well as providing a nice delicate aesthetic finish to that overall edge. And then moving to the toe cap, you can see internally we have Celastic here as well. That's pretty standard even when you get up to $1,000 their shoes that have Celastic toe caps. Now, lastly, cork. There is no cork in this shoe. This is a Blake stitch shoe. Now, just so you guys know, cork is not this luxury amenity added to shoes to make them more comfortable. Cork is a mandatory structural component required to fill a void created in the Goodyear welting process between the insole and the outsole. It doesn't even have to be cork. It could be leather, it can be like a felted material, it can even be synthetic. If you wear dress shoes all day, every day, nonstop, and have for several decades, you will probably be very sensitive to whether or not your shoes have cork, and that's a wonderful thing but the average person probably won't. I can tell you as someone who makes hour long videos about shoes that I can barely tell the difference. I've never worn my Blakes to choose whether this company or any other and thought, man, I just wish these had cork in them. I'd be so much more comfortable right now. I think the comfort of a shoe comes down a lot more to the quality of craftsmanship and materials in the shoe than it does whether or not it has cork. Let's move on. Beckett Simonon makes its products in periodic made-to-order batches throughout the year. This allows them to save on a variety of standard retail operational expenses, which is why they can offer these shoes for $219 as opposed to $300. This does mean, however, that you may have to wait up to three months before your order arrives. They do keep a small inventory on retainer though, so if your product arrives defective or you need a size exchange, they can usually process that immediately. You won't have to wait another three months. A dress shoe would not be a dress shoe if not for how it looks. While comfort, construction, and quality materials are all important, they are worth nothing if the shoe itself is not well-crafted and well-designed to make you look and feel sharp, sophisticated, and professionally competent. Let's take a look at every minute detail of design to see if these shoes truly hold up to aesthetic scrutiny. Starting off, let's talk about the last. Now the last is the overall geometry of the shoe. It's the model upon which the shoe has been formed. Now this is a true American last. It is straightforward, it's inoffensive. When we think of lasts from Europe, from Asia, we think of lasts that can be very curvy, very angular, but they stand out. They have a quality that sort of draws attention. This particular model is tailored to what the American consumer usually wants, which is a shoe that is basic, agreeable. It won't draw attention, but it will impress when noticed. Now last design is somewhat subjective. It is the artful sculptural quality of a shoe, though there are a few objective hallmarks we can look for when we are assessing the quality. So the first is asymmetry. You wanna see a shoe that is asymmetrical because that matches the shape of your foot. These shoes don't have that much asymmetry. Again, they are a pretty basic last. The next is complex curvature. Does this shoe have a lot of very interesting curves and swoops and angles going on the shoe? It doesn't really. It falls flat where the upper meets the welt it doesn't really have much of a curve coming down the side of the shoe. Is that a function of it just being an entry level price? Is it a function of it being a basic last? I think it's a little bit of both, but it does have a couple things going for it. One is the toe. It does have this particular drop here, this angle you can see right at the front of the toe. That is uh, very much a sign of quality and something you see on higher end shoes. It just provides a little sophisticated break to the shoe as well as a nice surface when the shoe is shined for light to reflect off of it. And then also the heel, which is probably the most impressive part of this last. This has a beautiful 
curved heel. You want a nice bulbous shape, again, that's reflective of your foot, but also adds this lovely sculptural aesthetic roundness to it. You want to see a nice curve where the vamp comes up to the instep. You can see you kind of have that here with Beckett Simnon, but it's disrupted a bit by this bump here at the top of the vamp, just a little bit of a bulging out. Now moving on to overall stitching quality and cleanliness. Now, these are all very nice. It's a very tight dual parallel stitch on the vamp, on the toe cap. They're very uniform and there's really no loose threads I can find anywhere on the shoe. There's one on the interior and we'll look at that in the imperfection section, but otherwise I have to say the quality of stitching all over the shoe is pretty good for this price. And then we have the patina. I hate to sound like I'm selling you guys these shoes, but this was probably what impressed me most when I first bought my Cohen loafers. These have a lovely brown patina on the toe, on the rear. It's wonderfully done. It's very smoothly and evenly blended. I think it just looks so great. It's not necessarily the most impressive from like a cost perspective, but I think from a design perspective, it's amazing. I mean, it's a really great way to make your $200 shoes look like they're four, five, $600 shoes. And then, the swan's neck. The swan's neck is a decorative stitch here, just aside the laces. Normally you would see at this price, just a soft, gentle curve, and that would be totally fine. The swan's neck though, just adds a little more decorative flair, a little more sophistication. And most importantly, this is very well designed, I have to say. To give you an idea, I'm gonna show you guys a picture of a Grant Stone Oxford. These also have a swan's neck very sort of stunted and angular. It just doesn't have that soft curving quality that's reflected in the rest of the shoe. Now moving on to the stitch density. Stitch density can have a serious impact on the aesthetic of the shoe. We'll look at that more in our comparison. These have a stitch density on the uppers of 12 stitches per inch. For reference, in the $300 range for shoes, you'd typically expect to see a stitch density between eight and 12. On the welt, you have a stitch density of five. Again, this is $220 in the $300 range. You'd usually see something between four and six. And then this welt is also fudged. So you can see these indentations here are the welt fudging. Let me show you the imprints. They're not super deep. You know, they very much are in that same vein of being mid-grade. When you look at them up close, they look kind of strange and clearly artificial. But from afar, anyone who's looking at these shoes, that's not you. They're just gonna see a very nice decorative line. And now moving on to the joinery. So there are different pieces of leather stuck together on the shoe and we want to see much like in wooden joinery, seams that are perfectly flush, don't stick out and are hardly noticeable. So starting off, we're gonna look at the welt joint. The welt wraps around and connects to itself. I like to test these joints actually just by using my fingernail and seeing if I can catch them. In this one, I don't even have to test it with my fingernail. You can even see it's totally fractured, so that's not great. However, when we move to the sole edge, you can see it is absolutely perfectly flush. I can't catch my fingernail on it going up or down. And then on the heel, you have the heel stack layers here. And similarly, I can't at all catch my fingernail. These are sanded even more flush than the teal beat my orcas I have. So that is a fantastic job. And these are also finished with a nice sort of semi-gloss burnishing, which I quite like. And then while we're on the heel, the next note is the closeness of the heel block to the upper. So typically you want to see a heel block extend no further than the upper itself to help give the shoe a sort of lift. And then also on the heel, you have this wheeling here. It's just a decorative wheeling, nice touch to what would otherwise be a plain surface. And then the evenness of the layers. So the heel stack layers, you want to see them evenly put and aligned straight. You don't wanna see them wavy or warping in any way. And then moving down to the bottom of the heel stack, you have these decorative brass nails here. They do help hold the heel together a little bit, but mainly they're just there for decoration. You would not normally see decorative nails at this price. Usually you wouldn't see them until you get into that $350, $400 price range. And then here you have this edge here, this little cut corner. You wouldn't be faulted for thinking that's a factory error. That's actually a very intentional cut that's called the gentleman's notch. It's really a historical facet to the shoe. Really came from an era when men wore much longer baggier trousers and this just helped it so that when they bent over or picked their shoe up in any way, it didn't catch 
on their trousers. It doesn't mean a whole lot to me, though, if it means anything at all, it's just another sign of craftsmanship and attention to detail. And then we have the stamp here. It just has the size and logo, a little bit of information. It's well done, aligned within the channels. And then the waist width. So this has a width of two and a half inches. That is usually what you'd expect in the three to $400 range. And then moving up the side of the waist, you have the beveled waist, which is where the sole edge goes from being square into being rounded. And that again, is just an aesthetic sort of touch of craftsmanship. It really helps tie the whole shoe together because you have the roundness in the upper reflected in the roundness of the waist. And then lastly, the backstay. So this backstay or backstrip here, it's really well done on this shoe. And what I like about the backstrip is that it has this roundness here, this concavity, which is sort of reflected in the convex roundness of the heel itself. So there's a nice sort of aesthetic duality going on there. Now we've talked about how great these shoes are, but how do they stack up against their most common market competitor, the Allen Edmonds Park Avenue? This shoe is similarly a cap toe Oxford with round laces. It retails for $395, a little under double the price of Beckett Simonon's Dean Oxfords. Starting off with last design, let's start with those objective hallmarks. So as far as asymmetry, both of these shoes have a very similar level of asymmetry. I'd say they're about equal. As far as the heel goes, you can see the Allen Edmonds just sort of falls flat on the last. It doesn't have any of that kind of roundness. On the instep, even though the Beckett Simonon isn't perfect, the Allen Edmonds has almost no curve at all. And on the toe of the last, the Allen Edmonds lacks that subtle drop, that subtle cutoff. And furthermore, you can see on the toe, the Allen Edmonds toe cap is actually a little pushed up and it's kind of wider in the forefoot as well, leading to kind of a chunky, stunted looking shoe. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's just like, it doesn't have that sort of slim, longer profile that Beckett Simonon does. And then as far as patina goes, this Allen Edmonds does not come with any kind of patina work. The overall stitching quality and cleanliness, the Allen Edmonds, you can see it has loose stitches here right at the vamp, just popping out. It's got another stitch on the heel, popping out here. The parallel stitching is uneven and wavy. And on top of that, it's got this triple stitching, which is just sort of a heavier stitch and leads to kind of a heavier, dense looking shoe that just sort of weighs you down aesthetically compared to the Beckett Simnon's tight, refined, thin, sort of delicate dual parallel stitch that really lifts the shoe. And even the laces, the Allen Edmonds are sort of dyed this kind of sad gray brown. The weave tightness, you can even see it's a much looser weave. They'll fall apart quicker, they'll deteriorate and unravel quicker. There's no swan's neck on Allen Edmonds, which is okay because that's a design choice, but typically you'd want like a soft round curve that reflects the curvature of the overall shoe. But here you just have a straight line that harshly drops into the vamp. The stitch density on the uppers of Allen Edmonds is 10 stitches per inch versus Beckett Simonon, which has 12. Allen Edmonds welt has four stitches per inch versus Beckett Simonon's five. And there's no welt fudging on the Allen Edmonds, which wouldn't be so bad if the stitching itself didn't pop out from the shoe and look kind of bad and swampy. And you know, it has, there's this sort of like adhesive or glue that's been sort of basted all over the Allen Edmonds welt. And it just makes the stitching look kind of swampy compared to the Beckett Simonon, which even though the fudging isn't the best, you can see how it much more nicely sort of frames the image of the upper. And Allen Edmonds welt also has this strange like spongy quality to it. It's I'm pretty sure it's real leather, but it's close to like a rubbery substance or like a really soft, super low quality leather. Definitely not something you want on a welt, which should be a really rigid piece of leather that helps hold the whole shoe together. Another sign that it will deteriorate faster. And then looking at the joinery on the shoe, the Allen Edmonds, to its credit, actually the welt joint is better than on the Beckett Simonon, though on the sole edge, the Allen Edmonds, is not flush at all. You can see it, you can feel it. If you dig your fingernail in, it's not even just catching. I mean, it's just totally digging in. The heel block is a little bit better, but you can still catch. The heel block extends beyond the upper and you can really see how that just 
holds the shoe down. It's sitting heavily on a platform where the Beckett Simonon shoe is lifted up aesthetically. There's no decorative wheeling on the Allen Edmonds, it's just a plain surface. And then the heel stack layers on the Allen Edmonds, they're sort of wavy and warping and uneven in their thickness. And then the gentleman's notch, you can see here, the Allen Edmonds does have a gentleman's notch, but it's not even well executed. It looks almost more like an afterthought and I've only worn these a couple times, so it's not like it's been worn down. And you can even see here that bevel on the edge of the top lift. That's not from me wearing the shoe, it came like that. So the milling on the top lift isn't even precise in any way. There's no quality there. And then also on the heel block, you'll notice the Beckett Simonon has this very lovely curve here. This is typical on nice dress shoes, and it again is a nice aesthetic complement to the roundness and curvature you see all over the shoe. The Allen Edmonds, just a flat square. And then there's no heel nails on the Allen Edmonds. And the waist width is actually two and five eighths inches, which is an eighth of an inch more than two and a half, which Beckett Simonon has. And then the channel, this important channel that houses the sole stitch that holds both shoes together. On the Allen Edmonds, there's barely a channel at all and where there even is one. The thread isn't even centered within the channel, but you can see I've only worn these shoes five or six times and that important stitching that's holding the whole shoe together is already starting to fray. And this is so important guys, because so many people think, oh, I should buy Goodyear Welt. It's gonna last longer, it's more durable. These $219 Blake Stitch shoes are going to last longer than these $395 Goodyear welted shoes because the channel is actually milled properly on this. <sighs> and then the beveled waist, there's no beveled waist on the Allen Edmonds, it's just a square waist. The upper lining on the Allen Edmonds is frayed, it's not well tucked in, it almost looks like a torn piece of cloth. And then the binding on the Allen Edmonds, it's not the thin, delicate French binding you see on Beckett Simonon and other high quality shoes. It's this cheaper, thick, almost rubbery looking collar. The backstay on the Allen Edmonds is this dog tail instead of a strip. That's okay, that's a design choice, which is perfectly acceptable, but again, the execution of it is just not great. You can see the stitching is uneven, and of course, we spoke, you have that stitching just kind of poking out. Now, would I buy these shoes over Allen Edmonds? Yeah, I'd pay more if I had to. Because again, they actually look good. Like many of you, I buy these things for work. They have a serious purpose. They need to telegraph to my clients the quality and attention to detail I'll pay to them during my service. The Allen Edmonds don't serve that function. All right, enough canning on Allen Edmonds. <clears throat> but outside of this comparison, does that mean Beckett Simonon is the best value on the market? To be fair, no. That award goes to Bridlin for most affordable quality made Blake Stitch shoe, period, and CNES for most affordable quality upscale Blake Stitch shoe. If you are strictly interested in getting the best value out of the shoe itself, these are far superior options. However, both of these companies will have far more restrictive return and exchange policies. When you are buying from Beckett Simonon, part of what you are paying for is a risk-free, stress-free transaction. Free shipping, free returns, fast and responsive customer service, and the comfort of ordering from a domestic company. Now you do lose some of these benefits if you are outside of the US, so for my international audience, Bridlin or CNS will definitely be better options. But even for how good Beckett Simonon is, the quality craftsmanship, the attention to detail, and the exceptional customer service, they are not perfect. So let's take a look at some of those imperfections. Starting with the left shoe, there's some dye on the beveled waist. You can see glue where the sock liner is adhered. Ideally, you wouldn't be able to see that. The stamp on the sole is slightly faded at the corner, and there is a small scuff on the sole edge near the toe. On the right shoe, the color has been stripped slightly on the French binding. There are these small specks on the toe cap. It's Actually really hard to see. I'm not sure if I can pick it up on the camera. There's a little bit of fraying on the welt stitching. And then there's kind of this scuffed bit or where there was some excess glue 
where the heel meets the outsole, and then this dye stain on the vamp on the exterior, and then again, a small dye stain on the sole edge. Now moving on to Imperfections, both shoes share. Both come with a slight roughness on the sole. There's a loose thread on the lining stitching inside the shoe. Where the vamp is stitched to the facing, there's kind of this lack of finish, or perhaps it's some glue stretching up, just leaving a little bit of an unsightly surface. And the right shoe's heel block is just ever so slightly darker than the left's. And then there's some slight bleeding of the dye from the sole edge onto the sole bottom. And then lastly, the overall leather quality. Again, we mentioned this before. It would be unreasonable for me to point out every tiny little micro crease and so on and so forth, but roughly these shoes will come with some micro creasing. You can definitely see it here on the vamp. There's gonna be some slight warping, especially that really intense warp where the heel counter meets the facing. Ideally, that would just be smooth. You'll definitely see inconsistent pore structure. These are all things that you might not even notice, but if anyone notices it, it'll be you and you alone. So I think for $200, this is all pretty reasonable, right? These are not perfect shoes. They're also not $2,000, which is what you would pay for perfect shoes. These shoes work. And I think this company's biggest strength is that they actually understand why people buy dress shoes. And that's that they work. They look good to the people around you in your workplace, and they are made with a level of craftsmanship that can be spoken about with pride. You know, I don't think they're gonna be right for everyone, but I think there's a lot of people for whom this is a great fit. They want a great, good-looking shoe that is of high quality craftsmanship and materials, but they don't wanna spend $300, $400, $500 on a shoe. Lastly, let's talk about my partnership with Beckett Simonon. I reached out to them because I wanted to showcase their product. I've used their product for years. I've gotten them as gifts for clients. They're great for me. While Dresswell is compensated if you purchase any of their products through my affiliate link, I am not here to sell you these products. Fundamentally, the purpose of this video is to provide you information to help you better decide whether or not this brand is right for you. But that is your decision to make not mine. I genuinely believe Beckett Simonon is a good company offering one of the better values on the market, and I would not choose to profit off showcasing them if I did not believe that. And if you do decide to buy anything at all from Beckett Simonon and choose to do so through my link, thank you, sincerely. It is because of you that I can invest the time and money to make these comprehensive resources that I wish I had when I was first making these decisions. If this video has helped you, that means it has helped many, many others. Thank you for supporting that.